Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Is it time? All right, so you guys had a lot to say. I don't know, some of you, maybe you don't like that genre. That's okay. But I heard The Notebook. I got a notebook back there. Anyone else like that movie? Another favorite romantic comedy, Notting Hill. I got two of those. Favorite love song, one of them was from Robin Hood. You know, everything I do, I do it for you. Brian Adams, that's a legit, that is a good one. Uh, let's see, Pastor Michelle, what's yours? Crash Landing on You. Crash Landing on You, okay. All right, well, you know, I mentioned favorite genre or favorite romantic co comedy or love song because actually we live in a society that really prizes romantic relationships. Relationships, maybe those kind above most others. Just think about the comedies that we talk about, right? The, the songs that we love to sing on the radio, the kind of the same tropes that come over and over again. Now, I got to hear, like, we got to hear what other people thought, but, you know, I think, what about, like, favorite movies about friendships? Are those easier to come, with, come up with? Maybe, like, books on friendship, films, like, hospital playlist comes to mind for me. Some people think it's boring, but I just love seeing them eat and work together and just talk and hang out and know each other's life stories, parents, etc. All right, no, no one's feeling me here? Okay, a few. But singleness is often portrayed as a life stage. One has to graduate out of, um, as if mar marriage is the end all and be all for all people of human existence. Think about why you may have been rudely and bluntly asked, when do you plan to get married? Or what's taking so long with the marriage game? And if I've ever asked you that, I am so sorry. I did that in ignorance. I won't do that again. But I'm not really trying to diss or knock on the sacred bonds of marriage or the sacred bonds of family. But I think it's important to remember that the deep and enduring friendships, that these are not exclusive to those who are married. Relationships, blood ties, school, workplace, you can have friendships in all those places. Right? You can have friendships with people within different life stages, different socioeconomic statuses from different parts of the world. Right? And so I think that we need to, as a church, as a society, we need to elevate and honor singleness. We need to elevate and honor and, and really cherish friendships that we share that are non-romantic. Because actually, in the end, it's not that we go in as in our professions, we don't even go in as uh, like little nuclear families into the glorious, uh, when heaven and earth come together. Actually, what remains is faith, hope, and love. Friendship in pure, raw, glorious form. That is what we get to look forward to. Hence, right now, we need to cultivate, celebrate, and invest in these relationships, amen? And if we're honest, no matter who you are, no matter how many Instagram followers you have, or snap, snap, pe people you snap. <laughs> you here, right? <laughs> all right, not, people DM you and all that. Not, even, okay, I'm sorry, I'm getting it a little off. But that's not, <laughs> we all long for, we really crave depth of friendship. Do we not? We need it. In fact, God created us as relational, connective beings. We were created, made, designed for friendship. So if you long for, hope for, desire for, even ache for friendships, meaningful, Christ-centered, life-forming, loyal, I'm gonna go on and on, but I'll stop there. <laughs> Affectionate, steadfast friendships, you're in the right place. That is actually what you ought to. That's a feeling, a desire that we begin this with. We all have it, we all need it, we all long for it, and we all can grow in it. So let's begin. We're gonna go into a story um, from Ruth chapter one. I can't go through the whole book of Ruth, but I love this book, and so if you have the chance, please read it, it's not very long. But Ruth one, one through 14. Hear now the word of the Lord. In the days when, the ju when judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Imelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, and they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Imelech and the husband of Naomi died, and she was left with her two sons. 
These two sons took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpha, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there for about 10 years, both Malan and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her sons and her husband. Verse 6. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go to the land of Judah. Where am I here? But Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, go back each of you with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them and they wept aloud. They said to her, no, we will not return. We will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Hope my, um, turn back, there, is, there was hope for me. I'm sorry. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. This is the word of the Lord. So the book of Ruth was written in the days when judges ruled, during a time when there was no king in Israel, when all the people did what was right in their own eyes, as you see in the end of Judges chapter 21. In other words, it was at a time when Israel was a hot mess and a low point because of their continual rebellion, right? They had the continual disregard for the will of God. So the story here, it focuses not on the warfare going on in Judah, but on this Israelite family who in search of food in their famine-stricken land end up in a foreign territory called Moab. And so by first, verse 5, you think it's about this guy named Amalek and his sons and his wife, but actually all the men die out. They die. And we're left with Naomi, who is the center of the story here, and her two daughter-in-laws, Orpah Orpa and Ruth. So this now widowed and childless Naomi, she is in dire straits. This is a really difficult situation to be in. In this ancient patriarchal context, context Naomi has essentially lost her identity. She's no longer a wife. She's no longer a mother. She no longer has the social security provided by her sons and her husbands. Now, Naomi has also lost the, the scarcity, that she, the, any economic you know, like protections to even try to forge a way of existence. So hence, she has to go back home with the hope that maybe a family member, a distant family member, will have mercy and be gracious to her and provide for her because no one is really obliged to at this point. What was she to do? So she's already going with them. Like you have to realize the story. And I'm imagining she's, ima she's thinking, actually, while I want these women, these, these daughters of mine to come with me, them coming to that with me is a raw deal. And so out of love for them, out of seeking their best interests, she tells them, actually stops them in the tracks and says, go back, go back. It's interesting. She says, to your mother's homes, respectively. Go back to your mother's homes. She probably can't afford to take care of them, and they deserve to be cared for. Plus, she's unlikely able to have another child, hence she's not really useful in marriage at this, in this context. So these women have another chance at life. She sees the situation as bleak. Go with me, you die. Go without me, maybe you'll survive. So Orpa, sadly, kisses her and goes. And we think maybe she gets the bad rap, because like, that sucks, why did she go? But actually, she's the one who listens to Naomi. She's the one who's dutiful. It's Ruth. She's like refuses. She puts her heels in the dirt, and she refuses to go. The scripture says she clings, clings to her. Other translations are stuck by her, stayed with her, remained with her, or clung tightly even. Now, it's interesting that Naomi says to these daughters from Moab, these are daughters-in-laws. 
They're not even necessarily worshiping the same God as she does as, as an Israelite. She goes, the Lord grant you that you may find security, each of you in your house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with me and the dead. And the word here used that is translated deal kindly in the NRSV is hesed. Do you guys know that word hesed? It's a beautiful word. And it refers to this quality of loyal kindness that characterizes Yahweh's, God's covenantal love. And that covenantal relationship between the God of Israel and the people of Israel. So what Naomi is saying is actually her daughters-in-law, they are embodying this characteristic of her Yahweh God, right? Their generous, loyal kindness is akin to God's. They're not related by bonds of marriage. They're only related by bonds of marriage, not bonds of blood, but they're willing to go the extra mile. Orpha goes back, but Ruth, she is doing something quite extraordinary. Now, what's interesting is that Ruth refuses to buy into Naomi's zero-sum either or idea that actually her future is bleak if she goes with her mother-in-law. She says, actually, it seems like she sees an opportunity in her survival is bound up in Naomi's. Her thriving is bound up in Naomi's. It's not uh, one for themselves or the other for herself. She wants to go with because together they're likely to survive and even thrive. It's through their friendship of journeying together that Ruth embodies hesed. So actually, I think that what Ruth does here when she clings to her mother-in-law is she's taking her relationship to another level. It's not just my mother-in-law. I see you now as my friend. I see you as my deep friend, and I'm gonna go through this journey with you together. In Proverbs 18.24, we hear that there are persons for companionship, but there are friends who are more loyal than family. You may have also heard this, actually this verse is kind of funky to translate the first part. The second part, the meaning is clear, but you might hear like a friend of many companions leads, a person of many companions lead to, leads to ruin, but there is a friend that sticks closer to, than a brother. But I think this translation conveys this simple difference. What the, what, what the author is doing here isn't trying to diss on like table you know, acquaintances, but make a difference between those who you just hang with your associates, your companions, your table partners, and those who are, you do life with. He's just making a difference. They're, not everything is the same. There are some friends that go beyond what's required, goes beyond when times are good, and will walk with you when times are rough, even bad, and go, through you, go with you to the other side. And the, 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 I think that that's what this proverb is trying to emphasize. You've got acquaintances, and that's fine. Coworkers, teammates, friends at school, right? That's, you don't have to be homie G funks with all of them, okay? In fact, you can't. You're not capable of being totally tight and simpatico with every person in your life. Let's be honest, we can't. And in fact, I think that's something we just have to acknowledge and embrace, even here at this church. There are some you're going to go deeper with, and others you're not. Okay, so don't put the same expectation on all people, but we need that friend, that companion, that are more loyal than family. Amen. So what's so cool um, and illuminating is that this Hebrew verb for cling that we just read in Ruth 1.14 and what we read in, first, in Proverbs 18.24 is the same verb for cling in Genesis 2.24 that refers to um, the man's voluntary attachment to the woman, his wife. It reads, therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife and they become one flesh. You see, this sticky clinging relationship is not only between married couples, but between friends who may not be of the same ethnicity, race, age, gender, and so on. So it has some pictures from different films and um, different images that help us imagine that. <laughs> the ultimate, Russell, right? Um, and Carl from Up, right? And I don't know if you like anime, but in case you do, there's this beautiful friendship in BL Metamorphosis between a young girl and a, an older woman. And there's this series of pictures that was taken by um, Mary King that I thought were really powerful. 
And so by sticky, clinging relationships, I don't mean the kinds that are greedy, needy, immature, codependent, toxic, suffocating, cloying, and without boundaries. No, that's not what I mean by clinging or clinging to or being sticky, right? But rather relationships where people are deeply committed to each other and share, share this strong and sincere, sincere affection and admiration. Drew Hunter reminds us that our friends, they do not replace our intimate friendship with God, but they actually help us enjoy the presence of God. We actually need friends to enjoy God because we enjoy God and his presence in relationship because God is a connective God in his triune being and in the way he formed and created us. This is theological reality, okay? That's right. So there's a Korean word and concept that I think aptly describes the kind of loyal, sticky, generous, fluid, warm-hearted, deeply committed and nuanced love that I think is embodied by Ruth and Naomi. And it's the word jung. Anyone know that word jung? J-E-O-N-G in English. My Korean name is actually jung. It comes from this word. And it's a way of rela relationality, like hesed in Hebrew. And it's, it's hard to describe. It's hard to say it, but you know it when you see it. And you know it when you feel it. You know what I'm saying? Right? Now, Kyung Mi Lee explains how this phrase, jung dolda, literally means like um, jung permeates, or it seeps in, it saturates. It's, it's an experience that sits at the periphery of the heart, surrounding like this thin veil or shroud of smoke. It's a connection that just is. I love that. And in a more scholarly way, Sue Park Kim describes Jung in a, it sounds like a lot like the love we see between Naomi and Ruth. Jung is similar, she writes, to compassion, but it is more than that as it leads to solidarity among people. The love and affection which Jung encompasses are not passive. Jung intricately weaves human strength to birth resilience in the face of trials by activating and connecting shared love and affection in human beings. This love is fierce and does not relent. We see that both Ruth and Naomi, they come to not only survive together and protect each other, but they also thrive together. They help provide for and support each other in very, I would say, resourceful, innovative, unconventional ways. They're ingenious, and, and they have to survive, and they do so together. They act in solidarity as friends and sisters and mother and daughter, and their jung makes them more resilient and more relational as their love spills over into other relationships. Leo, uh, um, Leila Bronner actually talks about the spilling over of their hesed in such that it influences the actions, the right actions of the people around them because they're so amazed by this dynamic, incredibly loyal, fierce love that they share without having to, it's voluntary, it's not ob obligated. These two women, they choose to be together and they show concern to, for the best interests of the other. They use their strengths, their age, their, their perspective, the abilities they have to help the other and vice versa, right? So we read on through the book that, uh, that there's a fuller story, that these women work, work toward their mutual survival and mutual thriving. All right? And so actually, the depth of friendship characterized by Ruth and Naomi, right? This depth of friendship, it inspires lovingness, loving kindness, has said among others. And I think that's something we have to say. You can't be homie G Funks. That's what I call my friends, okay? <laughs> when they don't know. You can't be that close with everybody, but that doesn't mean healthy, deep. Christ-centered relationships do not positively affect people around you. It spills over. It builds storehouses. There's an abundance, an excess even, where you don't have to be stingy or envious or have fear that you're going to lose something. But you can be generous, open-hearted, right? Open-fisted and give, making space, pulling out a chair, inviting people in. That's what Hesed does. That's what Jung does when it's rooted in Christ. So you need that strong center, and it has a centripetal positive force that moves, moves back and forth. 
It's like a link that keeps building because the world makes this kind of relationship so scarce, right? So we have to be clingy, jealous. Uh, we have to worry and be anxious that we're going to lose these friends. But no, the hesed and the jong that I'm, what we're talking about here, it actually gives you, you're at ease. You have nothing to lose, just more to give and to gain. Isn't that wealth? Isn't that joyful? That, is that something you desire? I do. Now, there are also challenges and risks to being intimate with others. It's messy. Getting vulnerable, you learn stuff, you see stuff, you know stuff. And it's not clean anymore. It's not that you're tainted per se, but with confession, which we need to do when you're good friends in Christ. With sharing your burdens with one another, with an active prayerful uh, uh, relationship, it gets messy. And that's okay, because actually, um, Sue Park, she explains that John creates stickiness that warmly embraces vulnerability. In a positive light, stickiness connotes strong, a strong bond, but negatively, it's messy. And so I'm showing this picture from BTS because, well, you know. But it's from a moment in which they're working and talking through a fighter argument, okay? Now, we don't have time to talk about it, but go watch it. It's really good. It's a long story, but what I appreciate about this scene is that these bandmates are willing to do the messy work, right, of dealing with their misunderstandings and hurts. Their tension, there's tension between, between v, v and Jin, all right, it's, it spills over to the whole group because that's what happens. Tension, strife, misunderstanding, hurts. It's not just you think you're holding it in and sucking it up, but it seeps out of you and it negatively affects you, just like Hesed and Jung spills over and positively affects others. And so after, you know, they, they're, they're, they do their thing, they get to, they eat, but they get together and they talk it out. I love that, right? Because so many of us, we want the depth of friendships that come from this enduring, sticky, loyal, affectionate bond. But we avoid conflict. And when hurts come, we flee. And when misunderstandings arise, we do nothing to clarify it. We don't ask questions. We don't make the effort and the sacrifice, really, to love through the messiness of these bonds. And you will not go deeper if you will avoid conflict. You got to work through the conflict because when you're close, you will have conflict. When you're not, you won't. The choice is yours. Friendships that are sticky, steadfast, honorable, on, honest, vulnerable, life-forming, they don't just happen. That is the biggest myth, the biggest, biggest misconception. People who struggle with friendships think that people who have good friendships, it comes easily. Oh, they're just magnetic. They just have charisma. They're cool. What can I say? But I'm not. I, that might be some of the way you think, okay? But actually, it's not true. Deep friendships take cultivating. Deep friendships take de-weeding. Deep friendships require this intentional time and space and priority in life. So it doesn't just happen. Now, it does get easier when you join a koinonia, when you be a part of orthopraxis, when you join a team or a band or the choir or something like that, right? When you go on retreats, go to sync and you do kind of crazy athletic events, I'm going to start working out this week to prepare. I take it very seriously, all right? Yes, that facilitates, but you have to make the effort to take it deeper. And just like muscles get sore, friendships too need to go beyond the, there's a resistance. And the resistance is self-preservation. The resistance is, I don't want to be known. I fear I'm not good enough, that I have to earn it. That if you knew me as I really was, if I, as I truly am, you're not going to love me anymore. Right? So we get hurt and offended. We, re we react. We push away. We say no. We say we, we, we've come up all these excuses. But if you want that, this, that kind of intimacy that you yearn for deep in your spirit, that God-given yearning, it takes effort. It takes commitment on both parties. It's a mutual thing. Right? The thing is this. The basis of this effort an investment in God, um, in, in God-centered 
relationships is the fact that God befriends us. God is a, is a befriending God. We love God, why? Because God what? God first loves us. Wani and Joe jo offers us a theological understanding of Zhang when she describes it as the power embodied in redemptive relationships. So Jesus embodied redemptive Zhang in his connection with other people and his cleaving to us on the cross. God is by nature befriending a sticky God. He cleaves or clings to us as Ruth did to Naomi. And even more so obviously, Jesus brings us back into true friendship with God because, as Pastor Brian said at the very beginning of this friendship series, sin is inherently antisocial. Don't think, don't joke around and say you're a sociopath, like that's not funny. Okay, that is not, that is not, that is a skewed distortion of your, how you're designed to be. Sin is inherently antisocial. It ruins relationships. Because why? What does sin do? It separates. Sin separates us from God and from one another. It makes us ashamed. It makes us want to hide away. It makes us want to be someone else that we're not, to be in darkness. And this is why the Apostle Paul declares that we are a new creation and able to be in relationship as a result with God and others. So in, in 2 Corinthians 5:19. He explains, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. Jesus, my friends, he restored and renewed our friendship with God, because that's what was broken in sin. By taking on the sin that separates us from God, what is it? He puts it, he takes it onto himself. He makes it possible for us now to be friends with God and others again. So we can now show ourselves to be friends of God when we love one another in ways that are sacrificial and sticky. So as we see in the example of Ruth and Naomi, sticking together in life, it creates bonds or jung. And these bonds are hard to break. There is a level of friendship we long for and need to become the people God intended us to be and can only have if we're willing to press through from French friendliness to friendship. So let's think right now. Some of you, you just take a little bit of a personal inventory. How many of us have this desire but we're just struggling with that step to move from friendliness to friendship or you you struggle with friendliness, like, let's be honest. <laughs> and that's something you gotta deal with. Because people be scared of some people. Because you look like you don't wanna be around them. Right? And also, that movement from friendliness or friend longing to friendship forming requires a great deal of self-awareness or the beginning of self-awareness. Because you need to know yourself and become aware of other people what are they thinking? What, are they, what gives them pleasure? What are they into? What are they struggling with? I'm yammering on, but this person, one time, I had to go to the bathroom. I couldn't tell the person. I had no chance. I was like, I, I, you know, like no awareness. And I'm, I, it's okay, I've probably done the same. But what I'm trying to say is, it, there is a practical, like it's learnable, it's teachable, that we can learn how to connect and make space for the other and also make space, you can be a part of that too, it's mutual, but it's free. It's not obligatory. It can't make it happen, but you can do ways, do things to help inch towards one another. So how do we cultivate friendships that stick? Here are some baby steps we can take. Like I said, it begins with this active, uh, beginning to activate an awareness and concern of, about others right? And an openness to being changed for good by them. You can't go into a life-changing friendship and not expect to be impacted by them. They'll leave their mark on you. That's why you choose your friends wisely. It's better to be a little lonely for a season than to hang out with bad people. 
I'm not trying to be judgmental here, but friends impact you. That's what friends do. Associates, maybe not, but friends will impact you. So you can go down with people, but you can also go towards God with people. So choose your friends wisely and pray about it and invest and cultivate these friendships. So if you're wanting to get to know someone better, invite that person to do something with you because friends do stuff together. It is true. Like you might do different kinds of things, but friends do stuff together. For me, eating is a big thing. Like I'm not super crafty though, I'm willing, I'm willing. Uh, Cause some of my friends like to craft, <laughs> right? Or plant things and such. But like, you know, you, you, there are things you can do. And I think I, what I've learned is some people like to do things side by side. A sports activity, go to some event. That's really fun, driving somewhere together, like a road trip. Others need to be face to face. Don't value one over the other. You have to get to know somebody to know what makes them tick and connect and vice versa, right? So be aware of that. That said, try to have meaningful, thoughtful conversations. And it begins by even like coming up with some questions. Like today, I'm gonna to meet with this person and I'm a little awkward, so I'm gonna try, I'm gonna to try to talk. <laughs> I'm being hypothetical here, okay? Right? And so, you know, you might come with the questions that you show that you're interested in somebody's life, in someone's job, in somebody's family. Maybe you heard they were sick and recovering from surgery or something, right? It takes thoughtfulness and intentionality. What do you wanna learn about the person? How can you encourage or pray for them? You can ask them that. And also be ready to answer and respond because friends, it's mutual. And so be careful not to think your therapist is your friend. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying don't do that. Go, be blessed, be nurtured, be, learn, grow. But it's not mutual. A friend wants to know you and be known by you. That's why these are so sacred. That's why there's not many. It's hard to do this right, with so many people, okay? It involves not doing all the listening, doing sharing, being aware. That's such a big thing, guys. That's its own sermon, but I'm not gonna talk about that. And if you're a parent with infants or young kings at home, if you're listening through um, YouTube or uh, online, I know this sounds incredibly impractical, maybe inconceivable, unreasonable, but here's the truth. You need friends too. Even if you have this beautiful life with you 24 seven, suckled to you, you need friends outside of that baby and your spouse, right? So if you know that, and you know nine months of isolation will do some harm to your soul, you gotta make effort to get out there. Invite someone to go with you when you take your kid on a walk. Invite them, maybe bring them a coffee or some goldfish, right? You can make it happen. Right? Don't hide behind your kids to avoid cultivating friendships outside of your marriage and home because you're going to find yourself running on empty and you're going to yell at your spouse because he or she is not supposed to be that for you. They're not supposed to be your every friend. You need friends, all right? And your kids need you to have friends. <laughs> Give my parents some friends, <laughs> right? So they don't hound me all the time, right? What are you doing? Who are you talking to? What you doing? Want to be friends? Okay. Reach out and be reachable. Don't assume people don't want to be near you or with you. And don't give up too easily. I decided early on that I want to be the friend that I want to have. And so I'm going to take initiative with my friendships. You know, maybe you plan three, she plans two, who cares, right? But we get together. Right? It's really not about that tit for tat, that, that, that calculating type of friendship. But you can't give up too easily. You also have to build a tolerance for the fact that people might say no because this is a free choice and people have lives. Just keeping it real. But it does take initiative and that does take courage and there is risk. Right? And there is trial and error because not everyone is your kindred's friend, your soulmate. Right? To be friendly and to have companions and to love one's neighbors, this is all good, holy, and pleasing to God. But there is something good and holy and pleasing to God about intense, intimate friendships with a few. Even Jesus had specific or specialized, um, or specific, specific, 
special, I'm sorry, I'm struggling here, special friendship with John, the disciple, as we learn in the Gospel of John. The health and the fruit of your friendship will have positive effect on the people around you as your relationship promotes affection, love and trust and honesty and bears witness to God in the world. So don't minimize this. It's not just about being exclusive. It's really about living into the fullness of God and helping others taste and see that God is good. God is relational. God is a befriending God. And we, as members of God's church, are a befriending church. We, by nature, are befriending people. So yes, try to have friendships that stick. But pull up a chair. Be spacious and aerate that. Always make space. There's not, there is enough room, right, to grow and to make movements in our friendships. And I want to talk to the youth here. Hello. Hi. We're so glad you're here. You know, people are like, when you're kids, I feel like young kids and, and teenage kids, they inherently value friendship greatly. Sometimes I'm like, it's not that big of a deal. But actually, I think they're onto something. That, in, that, that friendships matter. Friendships are important. Friendships are worth the investment. But, you know, you might go, like, well, I'm this age and there's only one, one other person my age. Or there's, I, I'm in this grade, but there's like everyone's in the two grades below or above. And that can feel like, well, then I don't have a chance to be good friends, to have jung or, or hesed um, among us. But actually, that's not true. We pray and hope that you as a youth group will learn to find deep friendship in the house of God. But it takes investment. It takes willingness to kind of break your comfort zone. And I want you, when you guys go to this retreat, free from parents and stuff, I want you to push yourself to not just talk to the people you like talking to, right? To get off your phone and commune, right? Because that is probably the hardest challenge probably for youth is to not to be on your phone at all times. But us too, right? How is the Lord convicting you to be more present, to be more open to God's befriending presence through the people around you. Echo Church, we're entering in a new season. Ecclesias are opening up again, right? Um, where people are coming out of their houses, coming back to church. People are lonely. The pandemic messed us up. Sometimes we, we, we actually are kind of weird in our social skills, maybe even. We have to learn again, but it's worth the effort. And take the time, and we need to be gracious with one another, amen? But we need to find good friends in the households of God and beyond. And so this is an invitation. Remember that God is a befriending God and he created you for this, this, this desire for friendship. Seek that in the Lord. Seek it in the Lord, but invest in it in others. God, help me to be a friend that sticks and to find friends that stick. Okay, amen? Amen. And so in closing... I'm going to share this one section from Echo's de lib um, child dedication liturgy. We did this a couple uh, weeks ago, but it I kept thinking about it as I was preparing for this sermon. Because it's re relevant to all of us as we worship together with our youth and as our children are growing up and new babies are like bursting at the seams. We say this, Echo, as your pastor and friend, I urge you as well, for the sake of our children, let's live humbly and gently. Let's not live stubborn and rebellious live, lives. Let's be patient with one another. Let's show our children what covenant looks like. Let's stay humble, teachable, broken before God. Let's introduce these children to Jesus by being good examples of living honorably, obedient, honorable, obedient lives that bring honor to God's name, and I'll add, and through our friendships with one another. And I want to remind our youth what we pray for you during your first uh, your first birthday dedication, if you did that with us. And we say this, or we used to, I'm not sure. I haven't been invited to one in a while, huh? Just kidding. May God bless you with great friends throughout your life. May you experience true and deep friendship with godly men and women. May you and your friends be a friend to the lonely, isolated, and bullied, bringing light in their dark worlds. May the friends you keep and the friendship you offer be rooted in the love and friendship we find in Jesus, for he is our friend who sticks closer than a family member. You are beloved by God, all of us. 
your family, and your family in Christ. None of us have to prove our worth to anyone. So let's close in prayer. And then I'll benedict. And afterwards, you're invited to leave if you want or stay for abide prayer time. Befriending God, we thank you for the sacred gift of your friendship. We treasure your friendship above all others, and we thank you that we can enjoy you through our friends. God, help us to find a friend in you and to be a friend that draws people to you. Sisters and brothers in Christ, go in the light and love of God with confidence, with courage, and generous hearts. Know you're loved and share that love with others. Amen.